And let me ask you, Doc, when we're talking about, you know, going back to the Ferrari Volkswagen comparison, um, you know, it's, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot in, in terms of understanding how we're prioritizing so many of our resources that are so close to being limited, but could be a game changer um, in relation to an individual patient. What we're learning is this is obviously not just a, a catch-all decision making that we're doing. This is case by case. What has helped you guys? Because I've heard it from you know, your colleagues before that you have learned from the practices of China and Italy and everyone else who has gone through this already to better inform the preparation and decision making that we're going to be making. What has best informed your colleagues in New York as to how to prioritize these resources when we're talking about these ventilators? And well, I'm not sure I'm in the best position to answer that. I can give you some opinions. Um, I think that that the first thing is the generosity of the people who have been in this ahead of us. Uh, the Chinese have donated parts and 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 masks and things uh, just through connections. There is there is a link there with the professional communities across would seem like big social and political divides that is really impressive and very heartwarming. And they've been very generous after having been through a lot of this and tested things that worked and didn't work and shared that. So that's one thing, uh, just, just sharing information and, and being generous when you can bring your own house in order and, and thinking of helping the next person. We're trying to carry that the next step, but really the model comes from them. Um, so, so that's one thing. The other thing is that this is a very unusual disease. One of the things we are benefiting from by not being the first to experience large numbers of cases is knowing what to expect. So we thought this was going to be just like influenza pneumonia and just like acute respiratory distress syndrome with needs for high levels of pressure and difficult to ventilate patients and problems of, of oxygenation, but not the limiting factor. Instead, what we've learned is that this is a quite unusual form of respiratory failure. The patients are relatively easy to ventilate. I don't mean easy, but they don't require the kind of high pressures that are part of the ARDS typical syndrome. We're finding that moving air is not the problem. It's getting oxygenation uh, and, and relatively simple pressures, which by coincidence, is exactly what we can offer with these Volkswagens, if you will, the, 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 the ventilator substitutes. They deliver relatively low pressures, which would not have worked anywhere near as well had we had typical you know, acute uh, respiratory distress as you see it in influenza pneumonia and as you see it in ARDS of other sources. So that's a good thing. The oxygenation is very demanding. Uh, they need a lot of oxygen. They are very PEEP responsive. So these are the lessons that we've learned and, um, and that make this whole approach particularly rewarding because it really does work. Parallel to that, there is an incredible amount of work going on, not in my field, but in other fields that I'm aware of. There are new treatments that are being suggested by what we learn about this disease. So there is now an evolving theory about why they have the respiratory function that they do, and it's not overwhelming virus necessarily. It may have something to do with thrombosis. It may have to do with things. That's why it happens so late. People do relatively well early on and then crash at seven to 10 days. We think that, that, that there was a lot of thing about the inflammation of the cytokine storm early on. Now we're talking about thrombotic processes, and that opens the door to new therapies, which are being explored. The other thing that has been really, really very, very, I think, uplifting to me, and I'm not part of this, but I'm hearing about it when our faculty discussions, which happen once a week, by the way, at 3 a.m. for me. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, the, uh, the, the, the research and the ability, they have mounted clinical trials to try out things like the hydroxy uh, uh, chloroquine like the antithrombotic agents, like the anti-inflammatory, they've mounted protocols with formal, well-structured clinical trials in which we are enrolling 45 patients in the first week. And they've got it together with one week from conception to approval, one week from approval to recruitment, and they close it out after two or three weeks. And then all they have to do is analyze the results. This is staggering. These are things 
taken years under normal circumstances. It's happening really, really beautifully. And the difference between just saying, oh, I think this works and trying it, of which there is a fair amount going on, and trying to find out if it actually works so that you can make it part of general guidelines is, I think, an important lesson for the community at large and for doctors who are not in the research sort of environment to, to understand that, yes, a lead is worth pursuing, yeah. but on the other hand, you've got to find out if that lead is actually taking you somewhere and quickly answer whether it works or doesn't with a formal peer-reviewed, you know, high-level research as much as you can in the trenches. And that's what's happening. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal how places, I know about Mount Sinai, but I'm sure it's happening elsewhere uh, in the academic part of, of medicine. They're rising to the challenge also. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's truly remarkable. And obviously, all of this is going to change our healthcare system um, in very due time, if it hasn't already. Um, you know, and I'm not just talking about a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, everything in, in terms of the, the very near and long term future of our healthcare system is going to change because of the response to this. Speaking strictly to this system that you guys have implemented, um, you know, which is, again, you said based off of a system of generosity and shared learning and you know, even even the randomized trials, uh, you know, being improvised to 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 suit the time structure that it needs to be done in. How much of this is going to stick? Do you imagine? Well, you know, like like everything else, um, you learn something, and then when the pressure is off, you sometimes forget some of it. So there's no question; not all of it will stick. But just as we are learning about telehealth, you know, I mean, there's been a tremendous kind of a dragging and, and reluctance to abandon our traditional way of practicing medicine. Telehealth has been slowly in, being incorporated in many practices, but really not. We've now been forced to do it, and that has kind of changed everybody's perception of it. I think a lot of that is going to stay. So more and more, I think we're going to be seeing mechanisms for home, home delivery of, of, of a consultation and care. Similarly, many of the models in research to try and accelerate collaboration and so on, they've been evolving. There's more and more of that that has been going on. Many people are working across centers and, and, and multi-center trials that don't take years and, and millions of dollars to set up, have been evolving. But this has pushed this into warp speed compared to anything we've done. I don't know how much it will, will stick. And, and maybe all of it shouldn't because, I mean, you know, crisis kind of things that help you through one phase may not be applicable to a more peacetime uh, environment, if, if you want to use the analogy. You know, the, the things that, that allowed us to build liberty ships during World War II may not be the best way to manufacture the, the standard uh, uh, boats that we use sure. in peacetime, um, because compromises were made that were necessary. I think we're going to see some of that. But what I think is going to change and has to change is that this crisis in all of its aspects has brought to the fore some of the societal failings that we have, in particular in the United States. There's a group of people who are, well, I was just having this discussion with my wife this morning, the word safety net. So what does that mean? So we talk about it a lot, but a safety net is a net that you put underneath somebody who is isn't doing an acrobatic performance, you know, at Cirque du Soleil or, or, or at a circus, and they're up there on the trapeze, they don't need the net until they fall. Until they fall. The idea is to have the net there in case, not necessarily while they're performing. Well, our healthcare system is like that, and it's sorely missing in safety net. There are a group of people who have no insurance or very poor insurance, there are some systems out there to, to treat them. In this crisis, these people are to some extent being helped free of charge by the resources that are being donated. That's not the way it should be. It should be where there is a safety net which gets called on when there's a crisis. And it's always the poorest. It's always the people who are a little on the fringe of the mainstream who are the most hurt by when the main system falls apart. And uh, which is not to say that Boris Johnson as prime minister doesn't you know, have some, some challenges to his medical care, but the fact of the matter is that the poor taxi cab driver who is an immigrant recently 
come to the United States, got his citizenship, and living hand to mouth isn't the one who's most stressed by this environment. And so I think that there's a tremendous pressure on our system after this crisis is over to rethink just exactly what do we invest in as a healthcare system? How do we deliver it so that people are either insured or provide something in the place of insurance like the National Health Service? Um, there are many names for it, there are many solutions. I'm not sure we know which is best. I know we don't know which is best for our country, but the pressure to do something has to be increased by this crisis.